Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this morning of Passion Tide, Friday morning and the 26th of March. No two days could be more different than yesterday and today. Today is blowing with uh, grey clouds above us, but you are actually seeing the lovely line of hyacinths, and I can even smell them from where I'm sitting here in the herb garden, where the box hedges have been uh, clipped for the coming spring. And although the, the rain is on the way, I think we can still say our morning prayers outside and enjoy the sense of freshness in the garden in, as spring arrives in the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, wherever you are in the world, please feel welcome here in Canterbury Cathedral on this morning, this Friday of Passion Week, as we continue our morning prayers together. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving power among the nations. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation, to you be praise and glory for ever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only Son was lifted up, that he might draw the whole world to himself. May we walk this day in the way of the cross and always be ready to share its weight, declaring your love for all the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Blessed be God for ever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm on this 26th morning of the month is Psalm 119, and I'm reading the section beginning at verse 105. Your word is a lantern to my feet, and a light upon my path. I have sworn and will fulfil it, to keep your righteous judgments. I am troubled above measure. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept the free will offering of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My soul is ever in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your testimonies have I claimed as my heritage forever, for they are the very joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfil your statutes, always, even to the end. Well, yesterday, the Feast of the Annunciation gave us a special lesson. So today, I'm going to read the section of St John that we missed, and also uh, attach it to this morning's lesson. So the lesson, not too long, but a little longer than normal, is taking up from the point that we left off uh, after the supper at Bethany, the meal at Bethany, which we read two days ago, where Lazarus and Martha and Mary were there giving hospitality to Jesus. And I'm starting, therefore, at chapter 12 and verse 12. This and tomorrow, the last time we shall read the passages of St John in sequence, because of course Holy Week gives us a completely different set of lessons, but we shall continue with this during the six sections, half an hour each, of the Good Friday three hours service, which will be put on on Good Friday itself. And, and so don't think that we shall um, stop reading just as the Passion is starting. Here, though, is chapter 12 and verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey 
and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus' disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves their life loses it, and whoever hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, they must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour them. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where they are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become children of light. A significant part of Jesus' vocation, and those of you who may have uh, been present online or have seen later the Sunday Eucharist for Passion Sunday will recognize part of that gospel that I've just read as the gospel for last Sunday also. It was a gospel I was able to preach on afterwards. So some of the things I'll say this morning will echo the thoughts I was having then. But let's go first to the prophecy of Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet being fulfilled that the entry of the one who had resisted any earthly idea of kingship, the entry of that anointed one into the holy city to fulfill his destiny and vocation as our Christ, our Messiah, our anointed one, is taking place sitting on the back of the humble donkey, not the war horse. And behind him come those who have witnessed 
and believed, not only the disciples, but the larger outer group of those who support Jesus and also an outer and, and, and more uh, um, numerous group still who are cheering and, and shouting Hosanna, the word of greeting which we shall say on Palm Sunday morning in uh, two days time. And as we do that we'll be remembering that in entering the holy city Jesus is coming to fulfill that vocation which he has been wrestling with and wrestling against temptations of earthly ideas of power and embracing the will of the Father for himself. But he has said again and again throughout this Gospel, my hour has not yet come. From the wedding at Cana of Galilee to this moment, my hour has not yet come. And now when Philip and Andrew are asked by some Greeks in the, we guess, in the outer courtyard of the temple where Jesus is teaching. When they're asked, we would like to see Jesus, then they both go to see Jesus, to tell him, and Jesus says, my hour has come. This is the moment. There is still a sense as we go through, as we'll see during Holy Week, a sense of, can I do this? Is this, the, is this the vocation the Father is calling me to? Deep inside, he already knows that this is the case. And that those who receive that same vocation and receive the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit within them, fulfill that same vocation. Yesterday, we had a whole day of vocation with the vocation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that image was set in front of us and her obedience set in front of us, even though she was pondering the meaning of it all. And now here is Jesus in the same way. The hour has come for the Son of Man, this title he uses of himself as the emblem of our humanity to be glorified by being lifted up. We already know, and the evangelist knows that those reading the gospel that he is writing already know what has happened to Jesus in the lifting up. The emblem of the cross is already before their eyes, but Jesus has to walk that way of the cross, which we shall do together. And as I said on Sunday morning, there's an interesting variation of translations. The ancient manuscripts with the I when I am lifted up will draw, and the words there which comes in the Greek, uh, pantas, is all, and in King James, all men to myself. It's a, 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 a masculine uh, um, Greek word at that with the S, but other uh, Old, Te Old Testament manuscripts of ancient derivation miss off that S, and we have the word panta, which means all things, everything, embracing. Uh, uh, I, I went into that in, in detail, the arms of Jesus embracing the whole world on Sunday morning. But at the same time, our collect, as you'll see from reading it this morning, when we pray that collect together, draw the whole world and all things, all of creation, his vocation from the Father is for that whole world and our vocation becomes also a vocation to care for our whole world and within that of course our relationships with one another and as we do that we are giving them the gift that Christ himself wants to give us. All those things as I say we shall explore on Good Friday during our three hours meditation which you'll be able to do section by section at whatever time you like, but we'll be there on Friday afternoon of next week from 12 till 3. And meanwhile, let's just have a little look, as we always do, at what has happened on this particular day, March the 26th, in years gone by. Well, let's start with 
1484, for on this day, William Caxton printed his first book. He was going to become the, f the first English person to work as a printer, to introduce the printing press to England, and to r be a retailer of printed books. And what was his first book? It was Aesop's Fables, which were known, no doubt, as they're known to us uh, in a form of short stories. Uh, Aesop was a, a slave, we learned from Herodotus, who lived between 620 and 564 thereabouts BC. But most of his stories were at first carried out by just telling the stories in one way or another until collections were made. But it's, it's clear that uh, um, Plato um, uh, knew them and, and uh, he says that Socrates in imprisonment used to write verses based on the Aesop's fables. Aesop a slave but obviously a very literate uh, slave and uh, a storyteller and we give thanks for those stories which we, we know so well the town mouse and the country mouse and well all sorts of, of, of stories but there's one actually on the fireplace of the drawing room in the deanery it's the, the dinner which the crane and the fox are sharing and uh, at, at first the crane is invited to the um, fox's house for uh, a meal and the meal is served on flat plates which the, the crane finds difficult. That part of the story is just done in little cameo on the stone in the drawing room and then the main story is told in relief in stone of the return story where the crane gives a meal to the fox as well but it's served in a tall glass which the crane's beak goes down into and the fox can't get near because his nose isn't, and his tongue isn't long enough. And uh, I, I remember an, uh, a, a, a mother abbess of, of Beck saying to me in the drawing room once, what is the message here for, for uh, Monsieur Le Doyen, uh, the, uh, the dean? And uh, I said, you tell me, mother. And she said to give apt hospitality. Well, that's, there's always a message on each of the Aesop's fables. And we give thanks for the imagination of Aesop, but also for the beginning of printed books where learning was allowed to spread. Uh, then we see that in 1839, the Henley Regatta began on this day, a sporting event, which still in ordinary years takes place on the first weekend of July for five days on the river at Henley. Uh, in 1885, this is interesting, the very first person to be cremated was cremated. And in those days it was uh, not a thing people were in the least bit used to. And at the Times in reporting it was, uh, gave an anonymous uh, uh, ascription to that first cremation. But now, of course, it's, it's something that we're very used to indeed. Uh, 1827, this is too big a thing to even explore today. The composer Ludwig van Beethoven died in Vienna and his music of course is a, a great gift. His, his music bridges the classical period to the romantic period and also we're very aware of his deafness uh, and on his deathbed he's said to have said uh, I shall hear again in heaven. But we give thanks for Beethoven's music on this day. Remember that on this day in 1923, the BBC began regular weather forecasts. Again, strange not to have them because we rely on them in a huge way. And in uh, 1945, David Lloyd George died, who'd been the Prime Minister at the end of the First World War from 1916 in a co coalition government up to 1922. And he was responsible for key reforms in laying the foundations of the modern welfare state. A fiery Welshman, David Lloyd George, as we remember him. Remember on this day that in 1973, Noel Coward, the playwright and entertainer, died and we give thanks for both his music and his acting and writing abilities. And in 2007, the writers, the, sorry, the politicians, Ian Paisley and Gerry Adams, Northern Irish politicians, made history in a face-to-face -face meeting 
and agreed on the restoration of the Stormont, Stormont Assembly and a way of power sharing. That at the time seemed an amazing meeting to happen between those two adversaries and representatives of very different parties and thought. And then in 2015, now this interests us, because in 2015, on this day, Richard III, the monarch whose body had been found underneath a car park when an excavation was being made, was reinterred in Leicester Cathedral. But also on this day, in 2015, we in Canterbury were preparing ourselves to receive at lunchtime the Queen and Prince Philip who came to lunch at the deanery on uh, March the 26th, uh, uh, um, 2015, and then Her Majesty unveiled the two statues of herself and Prince Philip on the west end of the cathedral church. And we remember the uh, sense of, of, of warm hospitality at that time, which of course is no longer possible during our, our restrictions of, of uh, both hospitality and distancing. Um, but I remember Her, Her Majesty suddenly noticing that uh, the monkey, the, my black cat, who was always, always around and used to sit beside me at the table at, at, uh, at any dinner party or, or lunch in, in his own chair, but we thought on that day not to put him there, came in and began to scratch the carpet and Her Majesty said, Who, who's that uh, uh, lovely black cat? That, uh, and uh, the... Um, I said, oh, that's, that, that's, that's uh, Monkey, my, my cat, he, he generally sits here, and the, the chair was brought, and so he sat there, and uh, so that was a, a great day for him as well. He's uh, somebody we remember, and, uh, but we massively remember the joy of the Canterbury community on that particular day when Her Majesty and Prince Philip came amongst us. Precincts were shut for security reasons, but all the people who lived here actually were cheering and glad that Her Majesty and Prince Philip were able to be with us and it gave heart to the community. Well then lastly, I want to say that uh, on this day uh, in 1874, the poet Robert Frost was born, the American poet, and again I'll come back to him in the three hours on Good Friday. We remember him for poems like The Road Not Taken, uh, mending Wall, and uh, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though he will not see me waiting here to watch his woods fill up with snow, the way in which the, 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 the rhymes stay in one's head. But we'll come back to Robert Frost. But there's another poet who also was born on this day, but in 1859, and that's A. E. Houseman, who again did wonderful things in terms of poetic verses and this little book uh, which is the Shropshire Lad as I've carried with me uh, all around the world really and here we are this morning um, and Houseman, one of the poets that songwriters loved to set to music this is number two of the Shropshire Lad and you'll know it well it's lovely for this time of year well maybe a few weeks on Loveliest of trees, the cherry now, is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride wearing white for Eastertide. Now of my threescore years and ten, twenty will not come again and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more and since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room about the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. Wonderful poem. And uh, Houseman had a way with words so that the image of the cherry tree in that poem becomes an important one. Let's uh, then turn to our prayers on this particular morning and give thanks for all creative gifts, whether it be creative gifts of Beethoven. Do you want to come up? Um, creative gifts of Beethoven or creative gifts of Robert Frost and A.E. And e. Houseman. I think Tiger may want to come up. He finds it a bit difficult to jump that, that much. Um, let's pray then this morning on the 26th of March for the 
Diocese of Banks and Torres in the Anglican Church of Melanesia. For in this diocese, Archbishop Justin, and uh, for Bishop Rose and Bishop uh, Tim at Lambeth. And this morning we're praying for the Kent Workplace Mission and the prayer request is from David Slater who's the joint lead for Kent Emergency Chaplains at this time of pandemic. So we're going to use then the prayer that I mentioned earlier, the Collect for Passion Week. So bring your own prayers and intentions to this. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in whatever language you like to use, we say the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. A moment of silence now as we say our own prayers on this Friday of Passion Week. Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for hope, a firm support for faith and the assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love and those whom you would pray for today and always. Amen. Well you don't like the wind but I'm keeping you warm and you're keeping me warm, which is a good partnership this morning. <laughs>